Welcome everybody to another episode of Beyond the Patterns. Today I have the great pleasure to welcome Gita Kutinok with us. She was educated in Detmold and in 1996 earned a diploma in mathematics and computer science at Paderborn University. She completed her doctorate at Paderborn in 2000. Her dissertation, Time Frequency Analysis on Locally Compact Groups, was supervised by Eberhard Kannud. From 2000 to 2008, she held a short-term position at Paderborn University, also the Georgia Institute of Technology, the University of Gießen, Washington University in St. Louis, Princeton University, Stanford University and Yale University. In 2006, she earned her habilitation in Gießen and in 2008, she became a full professor at Osnabrück University. 2011, she was given the Einstein Chair at the Technical University of Berlin. In 2018, she added courtesy affiliations with Computer Science and Electrical Engineering at TU Berlin and an adjunct faculty position at the University of Tromsø. In 2020, she moved to the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, where she holds a Bavarian AI Chair. So it's really a great pleasure to have you here, a very well-known and renowned researcher. And today her presentation is entitled Deep Neural Networks, the Mystery of Generalization. It's really great to see that there is more theory in mathematics going into the field of deep learning, where we see all these fancy applications coming up. But it's also great to see that people are working on solid theory as well. So Gita, it's really great to have you here and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. So the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Andreas, for the very nice introduction. And I would also like to thank you very much for the invitation. It's certainly a great pleasure and honor for me to give a talk in this uh, seminar series. Um, yeah, I think we all know how tremendously successful deep neural networks are. Um, but we also know, I mean, that there is still, I mean, a tremendous lack of a theoretical understanding. And so in this time, I will focus on one particular aspect of that, namely generalization, and where I'll shed a bit of light in on how we can actually understand it a bit better from a theoretical view. Now, as I said, I mean, if we look at uh, applications of deep learning, we see that they are all around us. It will be significantly increased even in the future. So think for instance of self-driving cars, think of telecommunication, speech recognition. Most of you have a cell phone, so you already use these technologies. In the US, I mean, legal issues are already solved by these type of approaches. For instance, job applications are always, or not always, but often pre-screened by neural networks. And um, I mean, the question is how it will evolve in Europe. And then the whole healthcare sector, um, which became unfortunately even more important uh, these days than it already is, uh, also there these methods um, are starting to be used for diagnosis and also for reaching critical decisions. And then if we get a bit closer to science, I mean, we see that also there, I mean, we witness a spectacular success of these approaches. So here, for instance, just a couple of months ago, you could read this article. Um, it was about a new deep learning based algorithm which is called AlphaFold2, and the article says it will change everything, makes gigantic leap in solving protein structures. And I mean, I think graphics of this shows that indeed, I mean, it's really a significant improvement over what you could achieve before. And then when it comes a bit closer to, let's say, my area, so I come from mathematics and work at the intersection of mathematics, also computer science, 
Um, also there, I mean, if you look at the area of inverse problems, in particular imaging sciences, um, so questions like denoising, edge detection, and so on, very classical problems um, there. These methods also had since about 2012 a tremendous impact. Most of the papers these days use these new approaches. And then there's this other area. If you are working in electric engineering, you're familiar with partial differential equations. Also, those are now impacted by these methods. In particular, if you are in the very high dimensional regime, then deep neural networks are very effective. I mean, they, what one says, they can circumvent the course of dimensionality in this sense. On the other hand, um, there are also, let's say, obstacles in a certain sense. So there was this incident just um, basically three years ago during one of the big AI conferences Ali Rahimi gave a plenary talk and he said that machine learning is alchemy at the moment. So he states, I mean, that these type of algorithms, people um, <clears throat> approach those mainly by trial and error. It's not clear which architectures are the best and so on. And so this raised a big discussion uh, and it called for a substantial theoretical or mathematical understanding of those type of approaches. And this is also crucially necessary because you see, for instance, I mean, there are also problems with trustworthiness of these approaches. You know, so you could read here, for instance, computers can be made to see a sea turtle as a gun and so on. So you could can also to some extent easily fool these type of approaches. And there are these very prominent examples from self-driving cars who should recognize traffic signs like a stop sign but if you place stickers in a particular pattern on those, then the car will not recognize this as a stop sign, but misclassify it and reach a completely different and also wrong decision at this point. And then again, getting closer to, let's say, theory and imaging sciences, which we already talked about, before, so this is, it says, deep learning's impact on image processing, mathematics, and humanity. This was an article by Miki Elat, uh, who is an electrical engineer from the Technion. And he talked about this, this problem that there are now these very powerful methods, um, which often easily reach the state of the art, but in a certain sense, um, we, we don't have any error bounds for those. We don't understand how they actually work which we could for the classical message we worked on for many years. And so, I mean, from my perspective, now first, I mean, from a mathematician's viewpoint, but think of this also as a theoretical understanding. I mean, there are two different broad research directions you can witness. One is to develop a theoretical understanding for, in particular, deep learning, which is like the workhorse of artificial intelligence. So can we derive a theoretical understanding of deep learning, mathematical understanding? Can we make it more robust? And then the other way around, can we use these new methods for problems like imaging sciences or partial differential equations? Can we use, for instance, deep learning to improve imaging science? And so on. So these two directions, I think these are two very broad directions which connect theory and mathematics with, with deep learning. And we, um, during this talk, we'll delve a bit more into the first one. Okay, so let's let's fix a bit of notation, and um, I would like to first show you um, for this, let's say, first direction, what are actually the key questions one would like to solve these days. And then one of them will be, well, obviously the generalization question, we will then delve a bit deeper into that uh, in the sequel. But let's start, I mean, very slowly to see, I mean, what neural networks are, how you define them, what to do with them, and then we progress. I mean, they are actually not very new. Neural networks are a very old method. I mean, they arose in 1943 by McCulloch and Fitz, who wanted to actually at that point already design artificial intelligence algorithms, and they did something smart. They mimicked the functionality of the human brain. Now, the human brain consists of neurons. So what they did was they mimicked uh, a neuron and designed what they called an artificial neuron. And it basically works kind of similar like a, a canonical neuron. There are incoming signals that are called Xi here, X1, X2, X3, and so on. 
They might be amplified here. This is done by these weights. Then they are accumulated in the soma. So here you have the sum over x i w i in here. And then the neuron needs to decide whether to fire or not. And this is done by comparing it to a threshold, a bias B. Depending on that, the output is one or zero. Uh, and so later on, I mean, we will then define the neural network by connecting all of those and the flexibility, which we can adapt during the learning stage are the weights and the biases. And so we can make this a bit more precise to give it a bit more flexibility. Um, so more formal definition of an artificial neuron is you have your weights, W1 to Wn, you have your bias, you have an activation function, and then you see this is precisely the expression from the previous slide, only that rho is now more flexible. Before it was just the function which, the so-called heavy side function, which is either one or zero, depending on whether this is positive or negative, and here rho can be a bit more flexible. Yeah, so that's an artificial neuron, and rho can be, as I said, the heavy side function. You can choose a very smooth function, like this model function, or which is nowadays always used, um, which we also use later on the ReLU, the rectifiable linear unit, which is just the max of zero and x. Uh, so you have zero and then you have x. Um, and I mean, it's a very simple function, but for practical purposes, it, it works very well. So therefore it is typically tame. It draws also certain advantages during the training phase. So then, I mean, you connect those, this leads to f linear maps and activation functions. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with this connection. So here you have, let's say for instance, three input neurons. These connections are mimicked by this matrix. Yeah, so you see here, I mean, the first, so you have these, these two connections here. Um, and this is exactly this line. So this weight times x1 plus this times x weight times x2 gives the first component of the output, these are these two connections. Then here, this weight times x3 gives this output, the second one, which is this connection, and then the last one. Then in here, you apply, so this was this point. Now here, you have now a vector in R3, and each component is a bias for one of those neurons. Then you apply your activation function component bias in each of these neurons. You keep going. So now you apply your next matrix, which is W2, which you see here, so you map to R2. Um, again, you have bias vector, and well, I mean, then you might also have an activation function, but this is not displayed here. Now from this, it's clear how a neural network looks like. Let me also mention that here you see, if you want to have very few connections, which is sometimes advantageous because of storage, restrictions, I mean, then you seek sparse matrices. Uh, so you have this direct connection there. Okay, so that's what a neural, a neural network is. Uh, so you have here, you see the extension of what we saw on the previous slide. These T's are now, this, these matrices, these weight matrices and the bias vectors, so these F linear maps and in between, you have here the activation functions, which are defined on R, so-called univariate functions, which are applied component-wise. And so this mimics then a very complicated network. So all of these yellow dots are artificial neurons. Now, so you always have some incoming uh, dendrites. This is then the soma in a sense, and then you have something outgoing. And also here, and then here you have basically, you have multiple outgoing connections, but they all give you the same value. Okay, so that's what a neural network is. Um, in its, let's say, simplest form to say, it's, it's a so-called so feedforward neural network. There are certainly a huge variety of other networks. So this is one very popular choice, which I mean, to some extent falls in this category as well. I mean, it's a convolutional neural network specifically designed typically for imaging applications, because there, I mean, you don't really care where your structure in your image is. Um, for instance, the CAT 
which you want to detect. And so therefore convolutions are used. Uh, and so here, I mean, you have your, your input, then you first do convolutions. So these are basically your weight matrices. You have an activation function, as we did before. But then you have an additional layer, which is a pooling layer, which in some sense is used to compress again. And then where well, you keep going. Um, so there are various variations of what, what I just showed you. Yeah, and then there are, I mean, recurrent neural networks and so on and so on. Good. So now how to use the neural network? I said this part is not only to introduce notation, but it's also to show you what are the key theoretical questions one actually needs to solve to fully understand how neural networks act. So what do you typically do with neural networks? Um, well, I mean, you have a function in the background, you have it defined maybe on RD, or maybe it's on a different object, like, like a manifold, or something more complicated. And maybe it's a classification function. So the outputs are just finitely many. Yeah, so for instance, think of this very complicated object here. So for instance, if you look at um, images in a, as points in the high dimensional space, one believes that images are located on some low dimension manifold-like structure. So you can think of that. And let's imagine, I mean, you have here images of dogs and here images of cats and your function would map those to the value one and those to the value two. Now, so then you have sample values, xi, f of xi, you split this into two different data sets, a training and a test data set, the training using, well, I mean, as the name indicates for training the test, using it later on, only later on to check the performance. Then, I mean, now if you sit there and you would like to use it, the first you need to decide is the architecture. And they are already to some extent this trial and error, which I talked about before starts because there are right now no precise, let's say results, which architectures are the best for a particular problem class. So you need to decide how many layers to take, how many neurons in each layer, which activation function, Maybe you want to not start with a fully connected network, but you would like to pre-select entries here or connections to be already neglected. So that would correspond to setting certain entries of these weight matrices to equal to zero. Once you have that, you have your neural network, you need to train it. We already discussed the training is to learn the weight matrices and the biases. Uh, and so this you do by an optimization procedure. Again, I mean, I just want to give you here just a very high level viewpoint. So what do you do? Basically, um, you solve an optimization problem. You see here, you have here the network function. And if you evaluate your neural network, which is a function in these XIs, uh, so these samples, you certainly would like to be this close to F of XI because you want to learn F. Now, this closeness is given by a loss function. So this could be the square loss. So the difference squared, or, but also something else. Then you might want to incorporate additional properties. For instance, you would like to have sparse matrices and sparse vectors, biases, because you would like to reduce uh, the storage requirements. So then, I mean, you could add a regularization term, maybe the little r1 norm, putting on the weights and devices. Yeah, and so this lambda balances between what, where you put more emphasis on. So this optimization problem is typically solved by what's called stochastic gradient descent. Gradient descent, I mean, it's a very well-known tool. You cannot use it out of a box here because you typically have millions of training samples and you certainly do not want to compute millions of gradients. And so what you basically do is you select randomly certain of those samples and only compute the gradient for those and then view them as like an average gradient. So that's basically stochastic gradient descent in a nutshell. Now, once you've done all that, which is also still a lot of trial and error because it's not clear what are the starting values. Um, there are a lot of tricks during the training phase, drop out and, and so on and so on. But once you've done that, you get your neural network and 
And then your hope is that this is close to F. And the closeness you now check by your test data set. Huh? So you evaluate this on XI and this on XI and then hope that this is close. So, so this is basically, let's say the procedure on a very high level, um, how to use neural networks. Um, why are they that effective these days? There are two reasons. The first reason is that we have now um, a drastic, as it says here, improvement of computing power. We can train deep neural networks. Yeah, and so this seems to make a huge difference. So we can train networks of hundreds of layers, which we could not do in 1943. And also we have huge amount of training data available. But it's still, I mean, a, a big mystery why it actually works, even with all this trial and error, because there's a very surprising phenomenon, um, which is not, not explained. And that's so-called overfitting, or let's say it that way, the surprising phenomena is that neural networks do not overfit. So what is this, what is overfitting? Let's assume you would like to do classification. You have here these green dots and you have here these blue stars. If what you use for, let's say, um, uh, classification um, is not expressive enough, let's say you can just do linear lines. I mean, then you see, I mean, you don't really do a good job in separating those two classes. Huh? So that's underfitting. You would do a much better job if you have more flexibility. And, and um, for instance, this seems to be actually a very reasonable choice in separating these two structures because you see, I mean, this green dot might be just an outlier, for instance. But then if you have too much flexibility, so for instance, if you have a neural network with millions of parameters, I mean, then it can fit the data extremely well. Right? And so then, I mean, you might get something like this. And then if you have another blue star, for instance, I mean, it could be put here and it would be misclassified. Yeah, so that's that's the phenomenon of overfitting. And that was always a problem. Uh, and so, I mean, this, this graphics here on the left-hand side shows the problem. Uh, so this is basically the classical viewpoint also of statistical learning theory. So here, this is, well, this is now phrased in statistical learning theory, but I mean, this is basically the size of your neural network, the number of parameters. This is the error. And now you see the training error. Certainly, if the network becomes larger and larger, the training error will go down. Yeah, so the error of this optimization problem. But the test error, after some point, will go up again. And that is the case when it reaches this regime. Because then you go into overfitting. And so then the test risk will go up again. So if you later on test on your test data set, I mean, it will, will, will change things and um, you might not get a good fit in anymore. So this was, it's very well explained. Statistical learning theory is all about this. But the true, the truth what happens now is this graphics. You see the first part is the classical part. But now this is the so-called double descent curve. Now after some point, the test risk goes down and it goes down further than it was here. And that is so surprising. Now yeah, it's not clear why neural networks do not overfit in the highly overparameterized regime. Um, um, and that is not, not, not explained. But this is why, why things work that well. And so if you talk to practitioners, which network to choose, sometimes they tell you, well, I mean, just choose the largest which fits in your GPU because there's somehow an inner regularization process which allows this curve. And it's even more surprising if you think of this stochastic gradient descent because you see this is normal gradient descent. You start and then you go in the direction of the gradient and reach here, for instance, this, this local minimum because it started here. Now, with stochastic gradient descent, it's much more erratic because you always choose randomly and so on. And so here, for instance, even if you start in the same spot, you might arrive at the global minimum. Now you see this. And then 
In addition, thinking that the energy landscape over which you optimize not looks like this, but maybe more like this, and it's not even clear which local minima is the best. And so, and then it's, it's, it's really a big mystery. Okay, so now what are the key, let's say, mathematical directions uh, one is interested in? One is expressivity. This was the first which you did. We cho chose the architecture. Uh, and so it's not clear what is the be best architecture which aspects of the architecture affect the performance. So this area, expressivity deals with these type of questions. And I mean, it's mainly areas like approximation theory and so on, which, which come into play here. The second is the training process, the learning. Why does stochastic gradient descent converge to good local minima? Although, I mean, the problem is highly complex. And if you know a bit about optimization, you know, that you do not really want to solve non-convex problems. Um, and there's now a lot of theory goes going in that direction as well. Even, let's say, strange areas like algebraic geometry, for instance, also use their methods to attack this. And then the generalization question. This asks, in particular, why do large neural networks not overfit, as we discussed? Also, what is the role of depths, which is also still not clear? Oh, and so this requires also a certain set of tools. And these are in fact, I mean, the three components of a statistical learning error, which I don't have time to explain, but I mean, as I said, statistical learning theory is one way to view neural networks. And then, I mean, the error from this theory cons consists of the error of the hypothesis class, the error of the algorithm itself, and the error because you just have sample values. And then there's another area which I find actually very exciting. It's called explainability, and it's a very different philosophy. It asks the question, I already have a neural network. It was already trained. It was given to me, I don't know, by a friend, by a colleague, whoever. Um, and now I want to understand how it reaches decisions. Uh, and so these are, in some sense, to some extent, the key theoretical directions. Um, let me just very briefly, this is not the main part of the talk, but very briefly just um, with, with one slide explain to you this area of explainability, because I think it's actually a very exciting area and it could use, let's say, also a bit more thoughts and more theoretical underpinning. So what people there do is they have their neural network and now they want to understand why it, for instance, classified this as a three. So the, what they want to know is how relevant is each pixel for the decision? And you see here, this explainability method said, well, the neural network put a lot of emphasis, for instance, on this curve here and on this gap. And that seems reasonable because the gap seems to indicate indeed that it's a three and not an eight. If you would have a network which would have misclassified this as an eight, then the network might have maybe already also looked here, but I mean, it would have said, well, I mean, these openings are actually not that good for that decision. Yeah. But still, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's still a question, I mean, what, what is relevance at all? Can we make this precise? What is optimality? Can we extend to challenging modalities? I mean, we have now a bit of work also in that direction using information theory, but I mean, I think it's just a tiny step forwards. I mean, there's a, uh, a huge open gap uh, in, in research still. And a vision is certainly to have an explanation of a decision which is indistinguishable from a human being and we are extremely far away from that. Okay, so this was our list of four different um, directions. And as I said, I mean, this will be now the focus of uh, the second part of the talk, namely generalization. I should say, I mean, expressivity is the most explored. This already started 1943, people analyzing um, architectures. This is a bit less explored. This is the least explored, maybe the most difficult. Um, and this is a very new area. I mean, their uh, theory has to be still developed. So generalization, as I said, I mean, the key observation is if you consider neural networks which are highly over-parameterized, I mean, there's a very small difference between the training and the test performance. So as you see, 
So remember from this curve, the test performance goes down again. And you can think of maybe it's, it's a property of the architecture, maybe some techniques doing training, but all of this falls too short to explain uh, the generalization ability. Uh, and so here is this again, um, what we already discussed before. You see here, you have, again, this training error. You have the test error. And so here you get very close. Um, and uh, so this classical picture does continue in an actually very strange manner. And there are a lot of methods which people now throw at it. I mean, VC dimension is an old method. Mahana Maha complexity, maybe the newest one is neural attention kernels to aim to understand why neural networks perform this way. And I mean, there's also a huge amount of literature and you see, I mean, there's some old work, this is concerning the VC dimension. And then at some point here, it starts to accelerate. And there is a lot of other work in this direction as well. What I would like to do now is I would like to um, take you to uh, an extension of neural networks, namely graph convolutional neural networks. And we will solve one part of this mystery there. And this is one aspect of generalization which does not occur in the traditional setting, but in this more general setting. And this we can completely solve and understand. Uh, and so these are my collaborators uh, on this part. I mean, um, Ron Levy is a very bright uh, PhD, uh, postdoc in my group. So here, Maskai just started as a um, as a PhD student, wrote his master thesis in this direction. Then there are Wei Huang and Lorenzo Gucci, uh, and where well, Michael Bronstein, I think, is very well known from Imperial College. The graph convolutional networks are an extension of a classical uh, convolutional neural networks, because classical convolutional networks can be seen as defined on a grid. And here we have more complex structures. So graph signal is um, a signal which maps graph nodes to some RC. And we will see that in detail later on, I mean, a convolutional neural network is very similar, very, it's a canonical extension of uh, a convolutional neural network. So you have your signal, you do convolution, activation, pooling, and so on. Uh, and so you have complex graphs and each node is assigned a value. So that's the graph signal. And then for instance, you would like to detect some anomalies um, and depending on your application. And applications are there, I mean, numerously, uh, for instance, recommender systems are one type of applications where you have certain products or, I mean, some customers already rated those and then you would like to recommend them to others who have similar interests, fake news detection in social networks, and which is a certain huge graph. And for instance, also chemistry, because molecules also are like a, like a graph structure. Huh? Okay, so let's, let's now take a look at what this um, generalization aspect is. So what was generalization in general? Um, you have your training data set. That's what the network sees. And then you hope it performs well on the test data set and you want to understand this. Now, here we have a particular special case in a sense. Yeah, so this is the classical generalization ability, but now you see, if you have, for instance, a graph like this, and you have a graph like this, let's assume this is in your training data set, and this is in your test data set. Then you see, I mean, these graphs kind of look alike. They might come maybe from, a, from the same continuous object. So certainly you would expect that the neural network has the same repercussion, so act similarly on both of those graphs as an input. Yeah, and so the question you can now ask is, let's assume, I mean, I have two graphs which model the same phenomena and we will make this precise. And let's say one is in the training data set and the other is in the test data set. Can I then at least for that 
show generalization ability, namely showing that a fixed filter or a fixed graph convolutional network has approximately the same repercussion on both graphs. Yeah, because then I mean, if you train the neural network on, let's say, for instance, this graph or saying this contains is contained in your training data set, and this is then your fixed graph. If you can show something like this, then you would show that if this is in your test data set, then the neural network also acts the correct way on those. And so see, this is one part of the generalization uh, mystery, which could then be solved. And indeed, I mean, this we can show. Uh, and I would like to uh, discuss with you how we did that. Um, and you can do that for a particular class of graph convolution network, which we'll also discuss. Yeah, so this part you can basically unravel. Now, graph convolutional networks, as I said, consists of these three parts, activation function, pooling, convolution. I mean, the activation function, we already discussed, really, you apply that component-wise. We, we don't need to discuss this now. How This is canonical, how this generalizes the pooling. You do typically by graph coarsening. So if you have a graph like this, then you coarsen by fusing certain nodes and so this is one of the layers throughout your graph convolution networks. The big question is, how do you define convolutions? Now, for convolutions, there are two philosophies. One is the spatial approach. So think of a classical convolutional neural network. Now, we said the classical one, you have, let's say, some your, your data in R2. You can view this as also being defined on a graph with a fixed lattice. And then, I mean, the convolution does the following. You have here a filter, and then you slide the filter over your graph. Ah, and so each time you place your filter somewhere, then, I mean, you, you multiply the weights of your nodes with the weights of your filters, and you aggregate this here in the center node. And this now you transfer to graph convolutional networks. Huh? So you again have something like sliding window, um, which tells you that these nodes, maybe the neighboring nodes, you need to multiply with something and aggregate in here. So that's the spatial approach. And then there's a different approach, which is called spectral approach. It uses the convolution theory. Huh? So it brings things into free of frequency domain. And then we um, apply the filter in its multiplication in frequency domain. So if you are from electrical engineering, I mean, signal processing, you should be very familiar with, with this concept. Yeah, so you apply the Fourier transform that way. There was a common belief that if you use spectral convolutional neural networks, graph convolutional networks, that they are not transferable. And we can show that this is actually not true. They are transferable. In fact, I mean, also for spatial, it was not proved. No, but now we will show that for spectral ones, this can be proven. And we will then also see numerical results that show that actually spectral ones, to some extent, even outperform spatial, the spatial approach. OK, so what is spectral filtering? Um, yeah, so let's assume I have a graph. Then, I mean, the, the vertices are here, are these, these nodes with edges. I think, I mean, I hope you're, you're familiar with this, these concepts. Um, you have an adjacency matrix, which tells you whether there is a connection between node I and J or not. Um, and then putting the weight in there in that place. Yeah, so that's adjacency matrix. And then there's a degree matrix, which for each node will tell you uh, the sum of the connections to that particular node. Using this, you can define what is called the graph Laplacian. No, but I mean, it's, it looks, I mean, it sounds very difficult, but what it is, you see, it's just the difference between the degree matrix and the adjacency matrix. You can normalize it by taking the degree matrix to the minus one half around this. And I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, um, with free modes, with frequencies. 
So let me see. Maybe I show this this slide first. Yeah. So I mean, in the Euclidean setting, in the classical setting, um, the Laplacian has this form, and then you have the eigenvectors of this are e to i n x, and you're familiar with this. This is, I mean, if you compute the Fourier transform, this is actually what you integrate against, and then you have also frequencies. And so this is basically the canonical extension to graphs, which you see here. So if you view this as a, as a matrix or an operator, you have eigenvalues, you have eigenvectors. The eigenvalues are the frequencies, the eigenvectors, the Fourier modes. And so this graph Laplacian, as it says here, encapsulates the geometry of the graph. If you look at the eigenvectors, you see, for instance, here, I mean, here you have very, very low frequencies, um, and then also you see, let's say, oscillations starting in these two dump shell um, areas. Yeah, so it's it's very much adapted to the geometry. Okay, so that's graph Laplacian. So now, um, yeah. So now, I mean. Um, you see, we want to define the convolution. Um, and we want to do it in such a way that we don't run into a problem that we have, um, yeah, that we cannot prove transferability. And the way we do that is by using a particular concept from functional analysis, but I mean, let, let me walk you through it and then you will see how we define convolutions. So there is a concept which does the following. If we have, let's say, a matrix or here, operator, it introduces that we can apply a function to it. The function will be the filter later on. So we will apply this to T being the graph Laplacian, and G will be the filter. Yeah, and so that will allow us to deal with the filter in a particular way. But so there's a general concept, as I said, I mean, if you have here let's say an operator with, with this decomposition, then we can place a function around it. And the nice thing is, if my function is a rational function, I can write this precisely down. Yeah, and always think of T being the graph of function. Okay, so this, this concept we now apply. You see, the canonical definition of convolution is this. You have here your filter coefficients, you have here your eigenvectors and then your convolution applied to your signal on the graph is defined in this way. Ah, so that's, that's a classical way to do it. But this has certain problems because you see, if I now modify my graph slightly and, and think of this transferability, should also happen if I just modify the graph slightly, then the filter should act in a similar way. But if I modify my graph slightly, these eigenvectors could change in an extremely uh, dramatic fashion. So, but if these change, then this, the action of the convolution operator on F will also change a lot. So I will never be able to show transferability and it will also not be true. Moreover, this is actually very difficult to compute if we have a huge friendship graph, for instance, because there's no fast Fourier transform for graphs. So this is a problem and a solution is this. Now, so here I think, I mean, the filter, you have these filter coefficients. Now we do it differently. Our filter is now a function, which we apply to this graph Laplacian. And this gives me this formula. Now, if you compare these, you see it looks very similar, but there's a key difference, which is this part here. And you remember what we said before, I have my graph, I modify it slightly, these UJs can change a lot. But these change a lot, but the lambda J will also change a bit. And this will now counterbalance the change of the UJ, and that will make this stable process. Yeah, so therefore this is much more stable than this convolution. And also if your G is a rational function, you can actually just directly compute it. You don't even need to compute an eigen decomposition. You don't need to compute the eigenvectors for that. 
Yeah, so this solves this is instability problem and it also solves the computational problem. Yeah, so again, so what is the key idea here? I have this graph Laplacian and now I define my convolution by applying a function to this graph Laplacian. Now, so that gives me another, let's say, action or operator um, just like here, but it's a different philosophy, a different way. And that makes it stable. Yeah, and so this comes from what's called functional calculus. Now, so again, I don't have, let's say, a discrete filter now. I have now a continuous filter. So as I have a function is a filter, which I apply to the graph Laplacian. This is now, let's say, what I apply in these different layers as a convolution. Okay. Okay. So now, I mean, we need to decide uh, what we actually mean by two graphs modeling the same phenomenon. Yeah, so we, we talked about this in a vague way. We need to make this precise. And there are different ways you can do that. For instance, you can say, I mean, I have a graph. The other is a perturbation of it. And then these two emit the same phenomena. Ah, so that's certainly valid. You can say there is something continuous on top of both of those graphs. And both of those graphs are sample from it. Yeah, so we have some continuous objects and both of those graphs are, let's say, uh, discretization. Only one is maybe a finer discretization than the other. And there's a different approach, which is the so-called graphon approach, which is very new. It says that, I mean, you have something like a graphon, which is like a continuous graph in a certain sense, and these two graphs come from the same sequence which converge to it. Okay. So all of those are valid in a certain sense. We will look at this a bit closer and also touch this to some extent. Okay, so what is the philosophy here? Um, so we, this is what we have. We have a weighted graph, we have points, and we have the strengths between the correspondence of those points. And then there's something which is called a metric space, just think of it as some continuous, if you're not familiar with this, as some continuous object which overlies this graph and which also consists of points and which consists of distances between points. So a metric space basically is a collection of points where for each pair, I can say which distance they have. Now, and so now I can view the graph as a discretization of this continuous object. And I can re relate distance to edge weight by the distance grows and then the edge weight goes down. No? So that's typically how you view this correspondence. Okay, so let's take a look at what we now want to do. We have these two graphs and they come from the same continuous phenomenon. No? So let's say this continuous object from which both are samples is M, I call it. And let's assume I have my signal now defined on this continuous object, yeah? So this blue part here, no? Yeah? So this is this is my continuous, yeah? So on this part, this is my, my, my continuous, my, my function, my signal. Okay, good. So now I first bring it down on the graph. I sample it, no? Yeah? So from here, I bring it down. Uh, and certainly it's different because I have two different graphs. Now I filter it, I apply my filter. And you see what will happen now, because I choose the same filter, but the, I, I can apply it to these two different graphs because the way I defined my convolution, how did I define it? Well, I applied this filter function, this G, to the graph Laplacian. And the graph Laplacian for these two graphs is certainly different because these are different graphs. Uh, so I can choose now the same filter and the way I defined it automatically adapts it to these two different graphs. Good, so I filtered both. Now I bring it up again to the continuous setting. So let's call this R, this is a reconstruction, bring it up. And now I can look at the difference. Uh, and so this is basically the key idea. I do everything on the continuous setting, I bring it down, I filter it, I bring it up, and then I can compare it. 
Okay, so now I'm going to look a little bit at the technicalities, um, not in too much depth, but I mean, so you have an analog domain, you have a digital domain, so the analog thing of here, I mean, take a Borel space, but I mean, just think of a continuous object with the normal Laplacian, you have the digital domain, the graph with the graph Laplacian, you have Kali Wiener spaces. I mean, if you come from digital signal processing, you, you're familiar with that. Uh, so these are spaces where the functions have um, are compactly supported in free domain. So the free transform has compact support, but limited spaces. And then you have an, um, a map from this Pali Wiener space to the graph, bringing it down, and a map which maps it back up from the graph, functions on the graph, bringing it back to the continuous domain. Now, so basically, that's what we also discussed on the previous slide. So now, I mean, we have these two error, three error components. Um, the first is what we are actually interested in. See, that's what we did before. We have our signal, we bring it on the graph, we filter it, we bring it back up. And we compare it to if we just stay on the continuous graph. Yeah, later on we will compare it with the second graph, but we will have two results. And the error will consist of two components. One is the transferability error of the Laplacian. You see, if you compare it, it's exactly the same, only that F my filter is just the identity. And then you have the consistency error, which is you have your signal on the continuous object, you bring it down on the graph, you bring it back up, you will make an error, and this is the error which you make by sampling and reconstructing. Ah, and so this is basically the result. Um, I don't want to go too much into the details there. So this is what you see here, the transferability error of the filter. This is the transferability of the Laplacian. Again, from the previous slide, this is the consistency error. And then you have certain, uh, certain constants here. You see how the constants, what the constants are. I mean, here you have, for instance, this C, which is bound for the, um, the reconstruction operator. You have here D being the Lipschitz constant from G and so on. Yeah, and so, I mean, this um, result is very general, so you can apply it in a lot of different settings. You can also apply it to if you have a graph and if your G is just a perturbed graph. So this was the first setting we will discuss. It's also included here. Or M is a fine graph and G is a coarse graph. Right, so this result is, is very general and covers a lot of different cases. And also... I mean, so here you see a real world example. You have a graph signal here on this, this bunny shape, and there's a perturbation of it to some extent. And then if you filter it here with a with a middle pass filter, and here you apply the Laplacian, you see that in both cases the error each time by filtering remains very controlled. Uh, so here, I mean, these signals are similar. And then also the repercussion of the filters is, is very similar. Also, that also happens in, in practice. And then this is, let's say, the, the big result, which, again, I don't want to go too much into the details. We have now our two graphs. We have our two Laplacians. We have a radio network here where we input those graphs. Um, and then certainly the graph passes through the network. So these are these different graphs which pass through the network. Um, I, as a hypothesis, also assume, you see, this is the transferability of the Laplacian, and this is the uh, consistency error, that this is bounded because I want to use the previous result. And this is then the overall error. If you have these two different graphs, which you pass through the network, this is the error which you make, the generalization error, which we, which we aim for. And you see, you have a very nice formula, which consists of the number of layers. Here, this was the uh, Lipschitz constant, the dimension of the Pali-Wiener Wiener space, and then also this delta. Yeah, so this was the formula which we got. Um, you see the consistency error you can certainly control by, for instance, I mean, 
looking at how dense the graph is sampled, the transferability of the Laplacian, you can also control. So we have, for instance, results in direction if the graphs of random samples, that then this error can be controlled. Okay, so let me briefly also mention the other approach, the Graphon approach, because I think it's also a very interesting approach now. I mean, in this community of graph convolutional networks, extremely popular. So let me just very briefly introduce you, then we see a few numerical examples um, and then finish, finalize. So what is the graph phone? It's, uh, well, it has here symmetric measurable. So it's a function on the unit square, like, like here. And the values are between zero and one. Now, so look, look at this function, for instance, defined on the unit square. And the function values are between zero and one. And so, I mean, from this, we can now construct graphs in the following way. If we have a graph and each, each vertex is, we assign a random value, then the edge between two points, I put there with a certain probability and the certain probability I get from, from this here. Yeah, so W, X, I, X, J give me the, gives me the probability that a certain edge is put there. So in that sense, I mean, um, so this is like a, yeah, like a procedure to construct these random graphs. Now, or like, or like a limit object, as you will see on the next slide. And if you have an adjacency matrix, you can always make such a graphone just by putting these values in a piecewise linear fashion. And then you get, again, a function on 0, 1 squared. Two zero one. Yeah. So here, I mean, you see more examples. If this is your graph, this is your adjacency matrix, in a sense, and then the graphone is like the limit. So it would be this function on zero one squared. Or if you have a very complex graph or random graph, your adjacency matrix will look like this, and uh, then the limit, the graphone, would have this shape. Now, so it would be this function from 0, 1 square to 0, 1. So it's like a limit object in some sense. And I mean, not again, not, not going because that is actually, this part is quite, quite technical. So you can um, then define what it means that a sequence of graphs converts to a graphone. So you have, the graphone is now basically like your continuous object and you have graphs which, um, which converge to this you can also, um, in a certain natural way, incorporate this um, the filters which we defined before, this functional calculus. So there is a natural connection to that. And then, I mean, one can also show results like, for instance, I mean, you have your graphone, you have a sequence of graphs which converge to this, and if you have a filter, then also the filtering of those will converge to the filtering of the graphone. And so then you have, again, the stability and this generalization ability in that sense. Yeah, so if you have, let's say, two graphs out of the same sequence, then this will show that, indeed, the filters act in such a way that the repercussion is very similar. Okay, so let me finish with some um, numerical results. Um, if you think about that, you realize that graph convolutional networks have two types of transferability. The first is concept-based transferability. Now, so what is this? I mean, your training data set can consist of multiple, multiple graphs. <coughs> Sorry. Your training data set con consists of multiple graphs. So, for instance, I mean, also these, let's say, the two graphs which were always our example, which came from the same continuous object. Then the network will already learn the concept of transferability. It will see there's the same phenomena. There are maybe different, let's say, uh, examples of the same phenomena. And so I better act in a similar way on all of those. That's maybe the easier transferability to some extent. The other transferability is my training data set just, let's say, for each phenomena just consists of one example. Then the neural network during the training does not have any chance to actually learn this concept of transferability. It has to rely 
on this, as it says here, built in capability of graph convolutional networks, uh, which is already there, which in some sense, I mean, we, we, we studied here. Yeah, so this is what we focused on here. And so in a certain sense, you can say the success of spectral graph convolutional networks relies on both types of transferability. Yeah, and so here, for instance, I mean, what, what you see here, this is to isolate the different types of transferability. You have here the, you have an image with different resolutions. Mm -hmm. So then you can say you have a continuous image. And so these are different samples of the same continuous image. And the neural network will just see one of those images and now better act in a similar way on different resolutions of the same image. And what you see here, I mean, the KDNet is a spectral graph convolutional network. I mean, there the accuracy is much higher than the spatial graph convolutional network. So here the spectral graph convolutional network has much more, let's say, inbuilt capability to transfer. And then these are different examples where here, for instance, I mean, you randomly remove edges. So this is basically your, your perturbation, which you, which you do. And what you see always is that the Laplacian error, the filter error behaves in the linear way. So in a nutshell, what you see here is that, I mean, the theoretical bounds, which we proved are resembled by the numerical experiments. And so you can randomly remove edges, you can add edges, you can remove vertices and all cases you see you have this linear relationship. And then what was very interesting to us was, was the following. I mean, there was a new paper in 2020, which actually focused on spectral graph convolutional neural networks. And so looked at different types of tasks, different rules. And it showed in this paper that indeed this spectral graph convolution network reached state-of-the-art results and often even better. And so this was actually, in fact, inspired by what we did so that we showed transferability for spectral graph convolution networks. And so this raised a bit more awareness that these type of graph convolution networks are actually very interesting. And what you see here is, I mean, that the accuracy is typically even better than previous approaches. Uh, so, I mean, Nielsen and Bresson, I mean, they, they did these extensive numerical experiments in this direction. Okay, so let me conclude. I mean, I think deep learning, deep neural networks are a really exciting area these days. Um, we see impressive performance in real world applications, but I mean, from my perspective, there's a lot of theory missing in particular, if you want to use that for sensitive applications, like for instance, in healthcare. There are certain directions which one uh, currently also pursues, and um, this is a joint effort of computer scientists, mathematicians, electrical engineers, and so on. We then focused a bit more on the generalization aspect, and I showed you that for a particular type of neural networks, which is the generalization of normal neural networks, your graph convolutional networks, you can actually solve one part of the mystery namely this transferability ability of graph convolutional networks. And so I think in general, I mean, there are a lot of exciting questions in theory, which are all still wide open. What is the role of depth? The architecture, which architecture to choose? The training phase. Why do neural networks not overfit? Which features are important? Which features are learned? And so on. So I think, I mean, there are very exciting future perspectives. What makes it also that exciting is that now a lot of people with various different expertise from various different areas of science jump into this and apply their unique methods to solve some of these mysteries. And with this, I'd like to conclude and thanks a lot for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for this presentation. I do have some applause for you, so I hope you can hear that, if I can do it that way. So we, I, yeah, I hope you would be able to hear, uh, have some applause here if we had a, a real, not a, we have a real audience, but they're virtually only present. So I guess they would be applauding now quite a bit. So, the 
this was a very interesting talk and you went essentially all the way from from the very basics to the important questions and i really enjoyed it a lot that you very clearly carved out which of these problems are yeah the most pressing and in particular you address the generalization generalizability and also the explainability was was a, a huge thing so do, do you have a feeling which um directions make most sense in in terms of explainability or what what do you what have you seen what you liked uh, in this direction that makes sense so concerning explainability i mean um There, there are different, let's say, approaches people take. There's, for instance, um, gradient-based approaches. There are approaches, backpropagation approaches, where you basically have your neural network, you have the decision, and you backpropagate it through the neural network. Um, so what we tried to do was to give a bit more, let's say, theoretical meaning of the term relevance. So what is actually a relevant um, pixel, for instance. And so basically, we, we use ray distortion theory for that. So we said you have your image and then you have maybe a certain part of it um, and you want like would like to know, I mean, if you obfuscate it in a certain sense, um, when can you still recognize this image? So this is basically the idea. You can phrase it in a race distortion framework um, and you can build an explainability algorithm from it um, where you then have a bit more meaning onto what, what relevance means. And in a certain sense, it performs, I mean, at least as good as previous methods, sometimes a bit better in the sparse regime, so you get very concise explanations. And you can also extend this to, let's say, other settings like all your data. Um, but I think in general, I mean, from my perspective, what would be certainly very interesting is to combine this a bit more natural language processing so that the neural network um, outputs also, let's say, uh, an explanation like a human. Maybe you can also ask the neural network questions like a human. And so this certainly requires a tremendously interdisciplinary approach. And I think this is where this area of explainability has to go. Uh, because in the end, I mean, you would like to ask the neural network like you ask another human being, like a lawyer or so, or whoever made a decision, why did you make this decision? And you would like to interact with the neural network. So, so it's also about understanding the latent spaces that actually are formed within the network and yeah, yeah. which information they still hold and which information they don't find relevant anymore at that stage. Yeah, exactly. Very, very interesting take. So when when you're describing the transfer of graphs um, to a continuous substructure, I think this is very, very elegant and I enjoyed this part of the presentation a lot. So of course, immediately shapes and meshes uh, come come to my mind. Uh, do you also have other examples where, where you can use this? Uh, is this... Uh, a, a, a classical thing because it, you you can model the multi-resolution hierarchy which is also a very common problem in computer mm -hmm. vision right or, or like missing missing connections in the edges so what what do you think are the the top applications for this yeah i mean so i mean from my perspective i mean first of all it, it's like a theoretical tool as we would like to understand um in a certain model setting whether this generalization ability is true. Um, so, so if you really have a concrete application, um, then checking whether this is true is then somehow a bit, might be, might, might be difficult because, I mean, it's not really clear if you have, let's say, certain objects to which extent they really come from a continuous part um, and then designing also um, an according distance. Um, but in general, yeah, I mean, so, so you mentioned already, I mean, what, what I showed you, like these applications, uh, image resolution, also perturbation in, in any way, edge removing. I mean, so there are, I think, a lot of different aspects and different, let's say, types of effects you can put on the, on the graph, which you could phrase in this language, which we have, and then apply it by the bounds. Hmm. So, which tasks are a part of the Open Graph benchmark? That seems to be a very interesting, um, yeah, very interesting database to use uh, to explore graph convolutions. So, do you, do you happen to remember a couple of those tasks? That 
Oh, so I think you're referring to the last slides. I yes, exactly. This year. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, if I could share them, I mean, if I could share the slides again, I could show you maybe yeah. um, those. I, I don't, yeah, so there are certain, yeah, so you see here graph regression, classification, node classification, and so on. I mean, I, I don't know more of those by heart. I will also need to look at the paper. I mean, but, but how many tasks are there approximately? Also that I will need to check. I, okay. Oh, yeah. So this is, uh, it's a very interesting benchmark and it's very interesting to see. Yeah. So it's also very interesting to see that the, the spectral methods were so successful. So mm -hmm. that's also a very important yeah. observation that they. Yeah, exactly. And, but I mean, one, one should also note that these spectral methods use these particular filterings. <laughs> yeah, so these filterings which rely on the functional calculus. I mean, so the other type of filtering, let's say the classical filtering, would not work that well because it's not stable. So these are spectral methods which are designed using this, let's say, newer idea of how, how to define convolutions. And then it works extremely well, yeah. <laughs> There's an interesting question here. Are graph neural networks more robust against adversarial attacks? That's an interesting one. <laughs> More robust than than what the normal neural networks than, than classical CNNs and uh, deep nets. Yeah, I mean, in the sense they are generalizations, so I mean the the others are included in those. So, so therefore, I'm not not really sure how how to answer this question. Um, yeah, because I mean, let's say the normal ones are a subset of, of graph convolution. Mm -hmm. It's not something which is which is separate from that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, to my mind, I, I think the, these adversarial problems are already very well studied in the classical setting in graph convolutional networks. I haven't seen that much um, studies of that type, but yeah, I, I wouldn't think that they are more robust in any mm -hmm. way. I mean, I, I think, I mean, they, they also suffer from this problem, and I think that's actually still also one main obstacle for using these type of approaches. I think that's something, robustness questions, which one needs to solve before using it also, um, I don't know, in cars, for instance, uh, in a very reliable way in health care, uh, because that could uh, lead to problems which do not occur frequently, but which could always happen and lead to um, radically dis different decisions. Hmm. Yeah, but then again, also the adversarial attacks, they are studied to some degree for the deep methods, but there's not so many people that actually look what kind of adversarial attack patterns emerge from classical methods, right? So mm -hmm. there's also classical image processing and lots of classical inverse problems and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a little bit harder if you try to attack an algorithm that has like a thousand iterations until convergence, because you have to keep all of that in memory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 not that you could not construct uh, adversarial attacks against any other kind of algorithm, right? Um, the the principal attack procedure would be very similar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not not robust, more robust than anything. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I um, must say that I really enjoyed your presentation. It's a, a very interesting work, and I'm very glad that you were here to present this. Thank you. And I would like to thank you again for this really great talk. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, as you can see, there have been quite a few questions, but maybe it also takes some time until you come up with the questions that you want to ask about this presentation. So if you didn't have a chance to ask a question in the live session, then of course, we are also very happy to forward your questions to Gita. Gita is available, of course, per email. She's also on social media. You can also leave the question here in the comments below this video, and we would be very happy to forward them to her. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I did. And I'm very much looking forward to welcoming you again in one of the next episodes of Beyond the Patterns. <laughs>